Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it. Your mission, should you choose 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 to accept it. Moses. Your mission, your mission if you choose to accept, to accept it, it, is to confront is to Pharaoh, 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 to lead my to lead people, my people out, of Egypt, out of Egypt and into and the into promised land. land. This bush will self-destruct in five seconds. Happy Wednesday. Will you stand with me? And uh, we're going to pray together. Man, that, that, the guy who played God's voice in that video, that was like really deep and awesome voice that guy had. I don't know who that guy was, but it's kind of like James Earl Jones' son maybe. I don't know. Uh, we're going to pray and ask God to bless us tonight. Uh, who wants to hear uh, just what God taught Moses, what God wants to teach us? Who wants to hear God's word tonight? Who's happy you got a cookie in your stomach? The cookie got a, more praise than the, than the word did. We'll have to work on that next week. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. It's going to bless us tonight. Heavenly Father, we lean into you and to your will tonight. We ask that you bless us. Uh, give us attentive ears. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Speak to us. Show us your word. And Lord, as we receive your word, may we receive energy and blessing and anointing and favor from it, Lord. May we be more in line with you and what you desire from us. Pray you bless your people and your church tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Give somebody a high five. Before you have a seat. Who here has watched some Mission Impossible movies? James Bond. I tried to watch the old James Bond movies. And I just can't. I just can't hardly get through them. They're just so old. But in every key special agent movie, there is the moment where the mission is revealed. There's the moment where the mission comes up, and for Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. He usually receives his mission through this device that self-destructs in how many seconds? Five. James Bond receives his missions through agent who? Who are you guys? <laughs> agent M. Agent M. He calls her mom sometimes. She's the old white, white-haired lady, I guess. Then the Q gives them the little gadgets. Anyways, watch a movie. <laughs> Agent M t gives Bond his missions. It's hard to accept a mission, though, from someone you don't know because there's so much risk that can be involved. So we naturally desire to want to know our mission giver. Last week he talked about Moses. He had been delivered he was a misfit. He had been rejected by his own people. He had a heart for mistreated and abused people. And he had an awesome encounter with God. Exodus chapter 3 is the first time, though, in Scripture, as we look at it tonight, where someone says to God, Who are you? What is your name? And who do I say? sent me. The Bible lets us know that God is not some undefinable force. Star Wars is bad theology. He is not a cosmic artificial intelligence. He's not a super 
universal computer. He is a spirit. And he has a name. He actually has a lot of names. And all of them give us more insight into who he is and who he is to us. This chapter teaches us that God is the ultimate mission giver. And he desires to give you and me a big mission in our life and a lot of little missions all along the way. The thing about God is when God shows up, he shows up often in times we don't expect it. If you watch enough James Bond movies, every once in a while the mission shows up while he's on vacation. Not when James Bond wanted to get the mission. And this for sure showed up when Moses did not expect it. Moses is now 80 years old. Who in here is 80 or above? Nobody. <laughs> One guy. One guy is over 80 years old. Happy birthday. <laughs> Moses, Moses was about 40 when he ran. It's been 40 years and he's not waiting anymore for anything to happen. It says in Exodus 3.1, it says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. You might underline that word tending. Here's what tending literally means in Hebrew. It's a verb. It literally means this. It means he had been watching and watching and continually watching the sheep. He was doing a lot of waiting and watching. Until this moment, Moses' life was stuck, going nowhere. Who's ever felt stuck in your life? Moses is stuck. In a sense, his life, in a way, has hit rock bottom and has been there for a long time. Yes, things could have been worse, but things were not going anywhere. But when you knew that you were supposed to be the one, when you knew that you were supposed to be Neo from the Matrix, you were the chosen one, you were set apart, you were specially saved, you were designed to be rescued, you were raised in a palace you weren't supposed to be in, but you blew it, and 40 years later, you did not expect God to come knocking at your door. He's not even taking care of his own sheep. It's not even his own business. It's his father-in-law's business. Where are Moses' sheep? Where's Moses' stuff? Where's Moses' business? Life is going nowhere for him, and he's not on an upswing in life. Nothing is promising on the horizon, but that's when God chooses to show up. A very strange time for God to show up in his life, unless you know God. Because God sometimes likes to stack things in his own favor so that the people of God, who especially who he's using, can see that God has set them up to see that he is the one who is doing the heavy lifting. We see this in the Bible a number of times. Gideon, God had a whole thing for, a whole plan for Gideon where he only had 300 men to take on, all whole, hundreds, thousands and thousands and thousands of men. God had a whole plan so that they would see that God was the one who was fighting for them. And he's kind of doing a similar thing again. Moses is empty. Moses is empty of himself. That's why he is ready. It looks peculiar to us, but it is a part of God's plan for his life. Moses is watching the sheep, and then he sees something he's never seen before. Who here has ever gone camping? How many times do you think I've gone camping? Some, some think it gets. Sometimes I've gone, I've gone camping. One time. I went once. In college, haven't done it again. 
I did it. I could talk about it. It was okay. But he's watching the sheep and he sees something he's never seen before, which is a fire. And, and, but this fire's happening. But when fires happen, you see things burn and it goes away. But this bush is not being consumed. He sees a sight God sets up for him to draw him in, to kick off a conversation that's so important to his mission and so important to ours. And it is this, we need to know who the mission giver is. There's a lot in life that you and I will, may, we may never understand. There are things we must accept that may never make sense to us. God's, God's word says that his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. Do you know what it's really saying to us when it says his thoughts and ways are higher than ours? You know what it's saying? I think he's a lot smarter than us. That his plans are actually over our head. We actually take, take peace in that. You're not supposed to understand everything. If you could understand everything, you would be on par with God, but you and I are not on par with God. Finite beings cannot fully comprehend infinite beings. So we need to know what God reveals to us about himself. We need to know the mission giver. Let's begin. Number one tonight, if you're taking notes, number one, Moses learns he is the God who doesn't depend on anything. That God is the God who does not depend on anything. We see this, this picture is given to us in Exodus chapter 3, verses 2. It says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself, why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Something happens. He sees the first fire in his life that does not consume. It does not run out of fuel. He sees a fire that does not need fuel. He sees a fire that depends on nothing, that is, is, is good all by itself. And what this tells us is that God just depends on nothing and no one. Everything else we've ever seen, we ever experienced came from something, was caused by something, depends on something. Everything else in creation has a beginning and has an end, except one thing, God. God is the only thing in the universe that has no beginning, no end. He's the only thing that depends on no one. He needs no one. Everything else needs something or needs someone. God is unique. He is not in need. He is the fire that burns eternally. He is the fire who does not go out. He is the fire who, who needs no fuel. He is his own fuel. He depends on nothing. Number two, Moses learns. He is the God who calls people. Exodus 3, 4 says, when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from inside the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. In the Bible, God calls lots of people. God is in the business of calling people because God is in the business of looking for people. This is not in your notes, but 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may support those whose heart is completely his. 
for Samuel 13, 14. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Sought out because he was looking and he found David. God is in the business of looking for people and calling people. That should excite us. Maybe it should even scare us. Because God has a record of picking people we wouldn't pick. God does not need people who have certain talent levels or this or that or the other. God goes about things however he wants to. Sometimes he picks the talent, but sometimes he picks people who are completely empty. But he calls people. Moses learns this. Number three, Moses learns that he is the God who is holy. Verse five. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. There's actually two things that we can hit here, because three times God mentions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A few things that we might be able to pull out of this for us. He's the God of people. He's not the God of buildings. He's not the God of religion. He is the God of people. He is a relational God. But here's what's interesting. In January, we looked at Joseph. Joseph is, is one of the few guys in the Bible whose life is not messed up with mistakes. But Joseph isn't in this list. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are much more obviously flawed. They're, 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 they're all very flawed. Jacob is especially flawed. And here's what's more interesting. Jacob almost puts the exclamation point on this because, yes, God changed Abraham's name. But Jacob's name was a complete transformation. Jacob essentially meant trickster liar, heel grabber. And the new name that he got was Israel. And Israel means prince. Prince with God. But God does not call him prince. He calls him Jacob. And he's almost saying, and he is saying, I am the God of not very impressive people. I am the God of, of not the best lookers in the room. I am the God of, of, of people that don't seem to be the right material for what others may choose. I'm Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's God. By the way, you're standing on holy grounds to take off your shoes. I want to share this with, with you about holiness. When you recognize that God is holy, it means we approach him differently. It means we approach, approach time with him differently. Holy in one essence means set apart. It's, it's, there's something special and, and other and different. It, it's, it's special, it's above. Not the same as everything else. Holiness and casualness are like, don't go together. God is holy. And when you're in a holy God's presence and you know it, you react to him and respond to him differently than you would in any other situation, any other being, any other person. How many of you have gone to a movie theater or one lately? You know that these days, sometimes people act kind of weird in movie theaters and do funny things that were like, they think they're at home or something. I just saw Endgame. Avengers Endgame, I'm not going to spoil it for you. And I'm sitting by this lady, and at the very end of the movie, she gets on her phone. You're in a movie theater. Screen lights up, hello, and like big things are happening. Like the most important part. 
of like a $300 million movie is happening. The room is full of fans, and a lady goes, hello? You know what happened to me inside? Righteous, holy anger. Because this is not appropriate. This is not what you do. If you're at home, uh, yeah. I paid like $13 for this ticket, and you want to do a business call? That's just, holiness with God is recognizing that when I deal with God, I recognize that he is different, he is special, he is set apart. And let me encourage, encourage you to think about that. Think about how we deal with God and approach God. Not that we become rule-based, but do I treat him as holy? Do, do, or do I even maybe treat other things as more holy than him? And this has kind of crossed my mind, and this is not like, you know, like a rule you know, to give to everybody, but this has crossed my mind sometimes, and, and, and life happens, things happen, but how many leave the movie before the movie's over? You ever go to the movie theater and be like, I don't need to see the end. I'm leaving before it's over. I want to beat the traffic outside. I got to be the first one out of the movie theater. Forget the ending. Yet sometimes in, in, in church, like that didn't used to happen. We're like, we got to beat everybody out. It's like, no, this is God's time. This is special. This is holy. It was not that long ago that at the end of church services, there would be a, an altar call and a time to receive Jesus. And when people had, the church would clap because they knew the end was holy, special, set apart. God is holy. Moses learns that God is holy, so he takes his shoes off. Who's with me tonight? Number four, Moses learns that he is the God who sees. He's the God who sees. Verse seven, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. God sees, we're going to jump off in the, into a couple of theological words tonight. Before we do, Psalm 147, verse 5 says, How great is our Lord. He is, his power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. Again, this helps us understand why we don't understand everything about life. God sees everything. So here's three important, here's three words you might learn in, in, in Sunday school or, or Bible class. Theologians will tell us that God is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, that he's omnipotent, he is all-powerful, and he is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere, you cannot escape, there's nowhere to hide from God. He has seen the oppression. He knows all, he is all powerful, and he is everywhere. Number five tonight, Moses learns that he is the God who hears. Verse seven, I have heard the cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers, speaking of Israel and Egypt, I have heard. Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. God hears our prayers. God hears our cries. Not everybody believes in a God who hears. Our God tells us that he does. Number six, Moses learns he is the God who cares. Exodus 3, 7 says, yes, I am aware of their suffering. 
He is aware of what they feel and what they go through. Psalm 103, 13 says, just as a father has compassion to his kids, so the Lord has compassion to those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, his mind, he's mindful that we are but dust. Psalm 103, 13. God, God cares, he knows our weakness. He cares about our suffering and our pain. Number seven tonight, Moses learns that he is the God who raises up leaders. God is the God who raises leaders. It it's, might not sound profound, but it really is. Exodus 3.8 it says, so I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into the, their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey or coke and carne asada. That's what I would say. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jedi Knights now live. I added the Jedi Knights in there. I wasn't there. Look. The cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I have now, I've seen how harshly the Egyptians have abused them. Now go, for I'm sending you to the Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. Why must he lead them out of Egypt? Because they cannot lead themselves. Israel had spent 400 years in this situation that had gotten progressively Worse, and they were not going to be leading themselves out of there. There are some things that only leaders can lead groups into. Groups by committee cannot do and make certain decisions and make certain things happen. Leaders can take us places we cannot go on our own. So God raises up leaders for us. And all the wisdom and blessing there is when we recognize the leader God places in front of us to follow. It reminds me, though, of Jesus when he was talking to Peter. It's after the resurrection. So this is after Peter had failed Jesus three times, denying him. And three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes. And he says, feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Tend my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Feed my sheep. This is a moment where God took a broken person who he had planned from before to be a leader and brought them back up, even in the midst. It's amazing how often God will find us at our lowest point and then pick us up. He did it with Moses, he did it with Peter, he'll do it with us. God raises up leaders, especially when we're crushed by failure. Moses was, Peter was. He raises up a leader for the church. He rose up a leader for Israel. And leading is a difficult task. We see this later in Moses' life, how hard it gets to lead a couple million people. But there is wisdom when we recognize the leader, the leaders God gives us, and we follow in a way that does not make leadership hard on than the Bible says to us. Because Israel was not walking out of slavery by themselves, and we sometimes do not walk out of our own slavery by ourselves. Number eight tonight, Moses learns that he is the God you can lean on. He is the God who is there, Exodus 3, 8. Moses protested, sorry, it's 11. Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? We talked about this last week. He was asked by an Israelite, who are you? And he asked that question four years later because rejection had not left him. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of 
Israel, God answered, I will be with you. Let's pause right here. I don't know how much I should jump on this because I don't know if I know what I'm talking about here. But this is really interesting. The question is, who am I? And God does not respond by saying, Moses, you are so special. You, Moses, don't you know how valuable you are? Moses, don't, don't you know? Fill in the blank. God, I'm feeling insecure about myself. God says, I'm with you. Not the answer we would expect, not the answer we probably give him. We were God. He does not tell Moses to look within himself, to find within himself the strength that he needs. He says, Moses, look to me. The value we have, the strength that we have, what we need comes not from us, it comes from God. Your strength comes from God. The Bible says, when we are weak, he is strong. Peter is at his lowest and Jesus calls him into the ministry. Moses is at his emptiest and God calls him into ministry. When they're not full of themselves. Because they are more easily dependent upon the God who can do the impossible when they cannot. God is the God that we can lean on. He's the one who we gain our strength from. Lastly, number nine tonight. Moses learns he is the God who is unchanging. Exodus 3.13. But Moses protested. But go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of those not perfect people has sent me to you. This is my eternal name for all generations to remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of unpromising material. Now God says, I am, I am. This is the words that go with the statement of the fire. I don't need anything else. I don't burn out. I don't go away. I don't have a beginning. I don't have an end. I created time and space. I hold it. It does not hold me like it holds you. I am. I am also means that I I have no cause. Everything in existence has a cause. He is the cause. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord. I do not change. Everything else in the universe changes. If we're lucky, we, we grow. God doesn't grow. If we're smart, we learn. God doesn't learn. If we're wise, we seek wisdom. God doesn't seek wisdom. He is I am. He is completely unique. He does not change. He is God all by himself. Here's what's interesting also. Again, he knows everything. What this means is before, before everything began, God made a decision. Before the world began, God made a decision about you and me. This is in 1 Peter 1.20. He is the lamb who was known long before the world existed, but for your good, he became publicly known in the last period of time. So first of all, he existed before time, the lamb. This hints at his crucifixion. Ephesians 1.4 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy 
and without fault in his eyes. What does this mean? This means that God decided that Jesus would be crucified before the earth even existed. Before time started, God decided Jesus would be the ultimate sacrifice because he knew. He knows, he always knows. There is no new decisions he makes. When Jesus said, it is finished, that was something that started before time had began. He decided to die for you before time, before the clock started. He is Jesus. At the beginning of this, we, we, we read about, at the beginning of the passage, it talks about the angel of the Lord. And then it says, God spoke. A little later we see, I am. John eight fifty eight. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Here's just a little thing for you. When you read through the Old Testament, when you see the angel of the Lord and then God speaking, scholars believe and I believe that is Jesus in the Old Testament. God, God would speak. Jesus would show up in this form and, and you see it multiple times in the Old Testament. Testament. Now, not Jesus is, is an angel, but see, we, God is holy. If we were exposed to him, it, 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 would, it would kill us. Uh, it, it's not that he's angry. It's not that God is grumpy. It's not that like God forgot to drink coffee this morning. Do you forget to drink coffee this morning? Who drank your coffee this morning? Who's not happy when you don't have your coffee? God's holiness is not a God grumpiness problem. It's, it's, it's like this. Who, who's thankful for the sun? Like that big ball of gas and fire in the sky. How do we know we don't live long without that big ball of gas in the sky? Okay. But who knows too much time outside and you turn into a lobster. Or, or I, I, maybe not you. I would turn into a lobster. I've done it before. It's horrible. Skin's on fire. Okay, we're on earth. What if, what if someone's like, hey, do you want to go to the sun with me? Who'd say yes? <laughs> Nobody. Why? The sun gives you life, but if you get too close, it'll consume you. God is holy. We are sinners. His holiness is a problem for us. We are in need as sinners of something to come between us and the holiness of God in order to come closer to him. We need a covering. That covering is Jesus. That covering is, is his blood. It's the only reason we can enter into heaven. When people say, why Jesus? Why not somebody else? Who else? Who else allows us to get close to God without being burned up? There's this other thing we use to cover ourselves to protect us from the sun. It's called sunscreen. Jesus is almost like heavenly sunscreen that allows us to come close to God because he is our covering. Because the holiness of God is too hot for us to get close to. Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the one who called Moses. Moses, I have seen, I have heard, I care, I am raising you up, now go. Jesus is the great mission giver. You need to know who he is so that when he calls you and gives you missions, you say yes. Will you stand with me? Tonight, just a little bit when we finish praying, I just want to let you know we'll have prayer partners in the front in case you want prayer for yourself, your family, any needs in your life before you go. I want to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes just to have a moment of, of prayer. And I just want to pray for us before we, we go. 
Um, just a special type of response. If you just want to say yes just to God and, and the mission giver, I just want to ask you just to raise your hands even just by your side. It's just a sign of openness to him. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are different. You are holy. And you know all, you see all, there nothing escapes you. So we approach you differently than anything and everything else. And Lord, tonight and going forward, Holy Spirit, may you continue to reveal to us who you are. That we be trusting of you when you invite us into a mission in our life. And may we trust you. May we walk with you. May we not say no. May our hearts be open to you. Tonight, before we say amen, if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you can pray this prayer with your mouth, with your heart. You can pray this after me, Lord Jesus. I receive you by faith. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need you to cleanse me of my sins. I want to know you and walk with you. And I choose you to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.